Welcome to the Behind the Bits podcast. Your host, Scott Curtis, wants to learn everything he can about stand-up comedy and take you along for the ride. Scott and his guests talk serious about comedy in every episode. Behind the Bits will uncover knowledge from different perspectives on subjects such as writing and performing stand-up comedy, as well as booking shows and the comedy life. If you're thinking about becoming a stand-up comic, already in the comic game, or a comedy nerd, Behind the Bits is the show for you. Now, let's get Behind the Bits. Hey, BTV buddies. Today, I've got Matt Levy on the show. I discovered Matt through his newsletter called Comedy Stray Notes. comes out pretty much weekly, and it's all his original musings on stand-up comedy, sketch comedy, Saturday Night Live breakdowns, just a lot of stuff that he is passionate about, and he writes about it. So the difference between this and some other newsletters, it's a, a lot of newsletters are just reshared stuff. So it's just stuff that has already been written and somebody else put it in their newsletter, which is great. It's fine. I, I subscribe to several like that. However, Matt, it's uh, his point of view and it is completely original. Check this one out. It's a really good one. Matt is either a first-time father now or just about to be a dad. So congratulations, Matt. And while I have your attention, it would be great if you head over to the TikTok, you know the TikTok app, and subscribe to 60 Second True Crime. That's all one word, 60 Second True Crime, and that's 60 Second True Crime. I'm trying my hand at doing some content creation. So if you could subscribe to that and check out the videos and let me know what you think, I'd appreciate it. And now onto the podcast. It's a good one. So I'm going to bring him up right now. It's Matt Levy. Matt, how are you? I'm good. Thanks for having me on, Scott. Yeah, thank you. And reading your last email, it looks like you're going to be a dad pretty soon. Yes, on July 15th. My on wife, Jul- who's in the background right there, uh-huh. is carrying a baby as we speak congratulations that's uh that's very cool yeah we're very excited no spoilers on the baby sex her name but come july 15th the whole story will be out for the world to see excellent so you didn't do a gender reveal thing or anything like that no it's all under wraps good yeah thank you thank you for not doing that yeah you don't want to give away (laughs) too much before like you want to keep the suspense going yeah yeah, because you're a father, right? I yeah, to yeah, father, yeah, father and about. grandfather. Oh, wow. Yeah. Congrats. Yeah. Um, yeah, this is what everyone loves. They love asking what's the sex as soon as you they know you're having a baby. If you don't tell them, you keep them intrigued. Once uh, you tell them, they're no longer interested. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I'll get that baby away from me. Yeah. I just think <laughs> it's the I think it's the coolest thing that you can just say, I'm gonna have a baby on July fifteenth because when that's the due date we don't I know, know yeah sure. i know but she could if she wants to because doctors can do that shit now i my daughter we went to visit my daughter when she was ready to deliver my first grandson and her doctor said you want to have the baby on sunday and she said yeah so they induced her and she had the baby on sunday wow. we could spend more time with her and when i was parenting children and my wife was pregnant for my for for my daughter i took the week after she was supposed to be born i took the week off from my manager job at wendy's and then she went over the due date and she gave birth a saturday before i was supposed to go back to work oh my god (laughs) fortunately it was a very nice wendy's franchise and they gave me the next week off too so it was it was it, it it was still a win. I got two weeks off and I got to see my kid for a week and then didn't see her much after that <laughs> for, <laughs> for a few years because I was in restaurant management for too long. <laughs> sure. I believe it. Wow. That's crazy story. Yeah. So how much PTO did you get at Wendy's? I'm going to guess in 1990-ish? Yeah. 1990 was when Jessica was born. Oh, nice. I think I, it was like two weeks a year. I get eight weeks paternity leave. That's nice. I know, right? So my daughter gets six months when she okay, had... that, that trumps me. Yeah, quite a yeah. Bit. yeah. Is yeah. she in education? 
No, she is an executive for Salesforce.com. Oh, I know Salesforce. Yeah. <laughs> legit. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Six months. Meanwhile, her, her husband gets like a couple of days. So. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my God. Yeah. The is, is he like a, her subordinate? I'm not going to get into that. <laughs> <laughs> let's just talk about your daughter for the yeah. next hour. Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. It's funny that I subscribe to some of these email, whatever you call them, and yours, for some reason, I just kept reading and there was always good tidbits in it and some of them are short and like this one's a little bit longer because you're talking about the baby coming and stuff like that. And I, I really get, I really got sucked into yours. I'm finding all your sketches and all the short films you did. And by the way, cotton candy is just weird as fuck. So uh, you saw cotton candy. Oh yeah. My God. And I've got my directed by David Lynch here thing and I think it fits. So yeah. So and you're one of these extreme creatives and I'm really stoked to talk to you about it. Yeah, man. Wow. I did not expect to talk about cotton candy. But if, you wanna, <laughs> if you want to get into that one, yeah. I'd love to. Yeah. That was about a decade ago. Yeah. Um, I was going to say you had reached out to me via my website, which I always thought was very funny because when I was doing stand up very regularly uh -huh. at shows, I'd asked to be brought up by you may know this next comic from mattlevycomedy.squarespace.com. <laughs> and you're the first person that does. I use those and very few of them do I get an answer. And I know it's like this unmonitored email for so many people. And they haven't got an email for 10 years. So there, I had one person, I think it was three months later, email me back and say, I've got this form on my website and it goes to this email that nothing else goes to. And I just found it. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, for sure. Mine somehow made it to my inbox and I was stoked when I saw it. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I got to see some of your story from the website. You started out in Arizona and you moved to New York in 2013 for the purpose of comedy. So can you tell me how that went? Yeah, sure. So I was doing stand up a lot then. I was editing in Arizona for a talk show called Right This Minute nationally syndicated, just canceled, unfortunately, oh. after a little more than a decade run. And I had a talk with my dad where he said, a lot of these guys that own Fortune 500 companies, they all say they'd give up everything to be 25 again. And I was like, oh, that's a really great piece of life advice because I'm taking – being 25 for granted completely. Yeah. So I said to myself, all right, I'm going to move to New York. And my dad was like, no, don't move. <laughs> <laughs> Just have fun. And then within two months, I'd signed a lease with some friends and moved to the Upper East Side with two guys from college. And I just did open mics for a long time. Uh-huh like every day for eight years, mics, shows, et cetera. And once the pandemic hit, I slowed down quite a bit. Uh -huh. And now that my wife is pregnant, I am completely putting it on the back burner because I don't want to be the guy that is neglecting the baby doing comedy stuff. There you go. There you go. Yeah. So what was the, uh, there's everybody that goes to New York, they always say that there's so much opportunity to get on stage and yet there's so little opportunity to actually be heard because there's so many there's so many shows out there. What was the difference between the Arizona clubs and going to New York? In Arizona, I was pretty green. So I had started really in 03 doing stand-up with my dad. And if you want, after this is over, I can show you a DVD that says Andy and Mo Levy, my old nickname, perform stand-up live at the Scottsdale Comedy Spot. We did classes together, and from 03 to 05, we were uh -huh. going up regularly, taking a class on Sunday, and then there was a monthly show, and then the occasional mic or bar show here and there, but I really didn't know what was going on. Then I took a break, and then in 012, I really picked it, or excuse me, 2012, I picked it up big time again, and once I didn't know what I was doing at all. I didn't even know how to get into the club bringer shows in Arizona. It was just signing up for 
glorified mics that were shows. Yeah. There's a spot called Monkey Pants that had a lot of really cool shows in Tempe and doing shows at Arizona State, but never had my own show or anything. Uh But I was just like going to New York and the stage time opportunities are endless here. In terms of like getting your voice heard, for the first six months, everyone drowns you out. I'm sure you've heard this before. It's just you have to earn your keep. And now that I've been out of the game so long, I feel like I'd have to do it all over again. But basically you're going last at every mic because every bucket is rigged Mm -hmm. and you are bombing a lot because it's this weird thing where you're like, we don't want another person, no matter how good they are, to exist. But after you show that you can hang and you put the hours in, you reluctantly become accepted, start going up earlier. You may run a show of your own. And then people start putting you up and all of a sudden you're a regular on the town. People know you. You start yeah. seeing people at the subway. You ride the train with them. They're like, do you want to go to the creek together? Which was unfortunately no longer around. I'm sure you've heard all about the creek. It's now in Austin. You'd go to the pit. You'd go to the late mics. You'd go to early Friday mics. You just go up and up. Eventually I did run a few shows. And that's when I realized, oh, the ultimate hack, at least in New York, I can't speak for everywhere, to... Maybe not industry success, but in terms of scene success is running a show because then people notice you. They're like, oh, I'd love to get on your show slash maybe you can do my show. And my show was super gimmicky. My friend used to make fun of my gimmicky shows all the time because I was desperate for audience. (laughs) So my my big show was called It's Everybody's Birthday. Uh And... I would only book comics who had a birthday that month because I thought they would treat it like a birthday show and invite all their friends. Of course uh-huh. they didn't. So <laughs> <laughs> comics don't bring anyone. Never. Did anybody fake ID you? <laughs> <laughs> After a while, I was just like, forget it. You can be booked on the show. It doesn't matter. It's not your birthday. I don't care that much. Eventually, I reinterpreted the title to mean it's everybody in the crowd's birthday. Uh-huh. So we treated it no matter who was there, it was your birthday. and We were celebrating your birthday, which was fun. We'd have cake. We'd have donut eating contests in between comics. There'd be presents on every table. Like I tried way too hard. Mm -hmm. We did the corniest bits, me and my co-host, this guy, Jesse Swatling Holcomb, between comics. My wife would often sing like Hamilton parodies. We just did (laughs) whatever we could throw against the wall and stuck Uh was what made the show work. I had another, after that, I had a show called The Comics Table Presents, where an audience member got a gift in between every comic. And then my last bar show that I did was called Free Fries, which really streamlined it and just said, it's a free fries comedy show. So if you came, you got free fries. Uh-huh. And that really brought an audience. It took a while. I was like, oh, just free blank is the true way to get audience to come. <laughs> So did you, in that case, did you have to buy the fries or did the venue say this is worth it and they went ahead and gave the fries away? The venue was a bit stingy with the fries, but we did not get charged for them. Okay. <laughs> they were, after a while, they were like, this doesn't really seem to be having much value for us. But <laughs> people did come for the fries. Yeah. But then they'd be, as my wife taught me this word, a bit of a teetotaler and not Uh, really drink all that much and they just get free fries so i think there was an item minimum for the free fries after a couple shows uh yeah there was a lot of politics and infighting with venues as i'm sure you're aware yeah yeah and looking at your body of work you've done a lot of sketches and you've done a lot of stuff was the stand-up something that you were using to get you into more of the sketch writing and short film stuff or was that were you doing that at the same time man these are great questions yeah i'm pretty smart (laughs) i really always just wanted to write for tv that was it and i did stand up at first when i was like 15 because it seemed like the most immediate way to get feedback and try and actually see what was funny. And then I stopped just to focus exclusively on sketch. But once I had graduated from college, I didn't have readily available collaborators. 
every single day at the school TV station. So I pivoted back to stand up based on my aunt slash cousin. When someone's like a little older than you, it's, she feels like an aunt, but she's a cousin. She told me that I'll give you a little bit of background on her. She was Mulaney's agent. Okay. And she also represented Nick Kroll and I think Aziz for a little bit, Ellie mm -hmm. Kemper. So she had a bit of industry sway and she always had little tips, never really gave me much of a leg up. She did take me to the first episode when Fallon took over the Tonight Show okay. and we had better seats than Sigourney Weaver. Oh, wow. I was, I, I, I was blocking Sigourney Weaver's view at the Tonight <laughs> Show. But she was like, if you really want to make it in TV or any type of writing, your stuff is silly. You got to realize what works for audiences and perform every night. And I took that to heart and really started to get as many reps as I could uh -huh. just to see what would work and got a bit obsessed and got distracted because I did move to New York for sketch and improv. But stand up was always the most fun in terms of just getting up and doing it. Like sketch is so much work. Yeah. It's got to be perfect. And a lot of it's just, this was loud. Uh huh. <laughs> as opposed to just a good joke is probably trumps everything else just in terms of simplicity and performer to audience ratio of fun. Like everything else is, it's a bit more sweaty, as they say. Yeah. And stand up can just be like, hey, whatever. I'm not really trying. I'm just a funny guy. It, it can be that simple. Yeah. Like it could just be Norm shrugging and that's enough. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I, I did pivot to stand up for that very reason. Like you said, I essentially wanted to learn how to make stuff that is on TV where you don't have an audience in front of you laugh. Like, I, how do you write an episode of The Simpsons? I did not know. Uh -huh. You write a sketch that's SNL worthy. You can take classes and you can have class performances, but unless you really get the reps, it's not quite the same. Uh -huh. Yeah. I always felt, I'm sure you've heard, you hear this all the time the civilian thing, like the civilian versus the stand-up. I feel like I've transitioned back into a civilian, but for a while, it's like everything comedy all the time. And just like when I was in these classes, I felt superior to others, which is a disgusting thing to say. <laughs> but I just done so many hours that it felt like everyone else was on a lower plane and I was operating on this higher plane, whereas now I feel like I'm definitely operating on that low plane again. Yeah. And it really... It's like a, it's a real thing because when I moved from South Bend, Indiana to Huntsville, and I was doing stand up quite a bit when I was in South Bend, but between the move and switching jobs and the fact that my wife and I don't know anybody, we, I just didn't get out that much. And when I did get out, it's definitely not like riding a bike. It's you're almost starting over again and man, it's tough. Yeah, I don't really look forward to going back. I don't know if I ever really will. We'll see. But I did do a few mics and shows here over the pandemic. And I was like, oh, God, I'm one of the bad people again. It's such a <laughs> bummer when you become one of the bad people again. <laughs> like, it is like I'm riding with training wheels again. I feel like I'm going back to old crutches, like bomb lines that I'd used in my first year kind of thing. There was a bar called Much Mores, and if ever a joke bombed there, I'd say, that joke deserved Much Mores. Yeah. Just stu <laughs> stupid stuff like that. And I was like, <laughs> I can't write anymore. I used to write hard punchlines that would hit, or at least I'd be able to perform kind of silly stuff that would at least be elevated by my chops. Yeah. But now, I don't know if I could do a good three. So there is that. <laughs> yeah. All the jokes are like soupy in my head. I wrote uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. So much material, as I'm sure you've written hours, and you're just like, if you don't think about it, it's yeah. just gone. Yeah, yeah. And if you don't have, if you don't have to do a mic, or you're not on a show, or something like that, it's really hard to just look at it and have that soak in, so that you know it when you do get on something. If there's not something ahead of you that is somewhat important then it's it just sits there 
Yeah. Along with your ability to actually perform on stage and hold a microphone correctly and not trip and stuff like that. Yes. <laughs> uh, I guess to that, I would say having a show is what would keep one sharp. Yeah. Because there was always something to look forward to. And there'd always be three to four regulars and you would feel that heaving guilt of performing the same material in front of them. I can't let this person see my joke about making out with a stranger again. Yeah. Like they've heard that joke 50 times. I, I, I couldn't do that to them. So there, there was the pressure of I got to keep writing. I got to keep practicing because Jim Beckett will be there. And if Jim has heard this joke again, he may never come back. Yeah. Yeah. And there is no Jim Beckett. I just first name I thought of. Yeah. Now you've got you've got enough of your stand up out there that I, I got to get to know how you are. And you're pretty unique in your pacing and don't want to call it low energy. Um, it was a bit low energy, though. Yeah, I do want to call it like just normal energy. I feel like I'm just sitting here and some dude's talking to me and, and you, you bring some real, I'll keep going back to David Lynch. You just seem like somebody who would be a kindred spirit with David Lynch, because I think you do some really cringy stuff on purpose just to see what the reaction is. I did that when I was young for sure. Okay. Okay. Like and the Seinfeld I don't think joke when, the, when Seinfeld oh, came yeah. in the deli. Yes, I do like to wallow in this weird, make the audience kind of pity me in a way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Energy, for sure. That was my thing. And that joke, the first time I did it, it was such a banger that I was like, <laughs> well, I got to keep it up forever. And it was... I'll, I I'll loved honest, it. I, I'm removed from it. <laughs> That joke was a few different things. I worked at a counter service restaurant and I did say, we'll tell jokes for tips. And then I just had the vision one day that pre Seinfeld, when Louis CK was still in the public's favor, that a Louis CK would walk in uh -huh. and how he would react to some idiot with a sign that says, we tell jokes for tips. And then I obviously changed it to Seinfeld, but the cool thing about that joke that I love about that joke and that I would often change is the joke within a joke. I tried to write a lot of jokes that had bad jokes within them uh -huh. to make the other punchline hit a little harder. Yeah. So the one I think I often did was, um, <sighs> wow, it's been a minute, but what did Julius Caesar say to the beautiful woman? Carpe oh. damn. Yeah. Girl, how you fit in them toga pants. I came, I saw, I came. Just so stupid. And the crowd would often look at me with shock. And I would definitely hold that because the real punch is that he takes the dollar. Away, yeah. Uh -huh. Which I later learned was in an episode of Seinfeld and kind of ruins any shred of originality to it. Yeah. It was definitely fun. I did love that stupid joke. And the whole setup of it was even surreal. Yeah. And you had to change it to Seinfeld because Louis got canceled and Jerry Seinfeld comes in. He had that TV show. Nobody yeah. in the world knows who Jerry Seinfeld is or it's just in their periphery. Right. And I just, I, re I really like that because I'm a little bit like that too. So I felt like a kindred spirit because I'm just, I'm super weird. And the thing is, I don't look like somebody who'd be su super weird. I look like somebody's dad or a baseball coach or a pharmacist or something like that. And so when that stuff comes out of my mouth, I think it carries a bigger punch because nobody expected it. Yeah. And I look like the most boring coworker. Of yeah. All time. Yeah. And I actually am the most boring coworker of all time. So I do live up to that, but occasionally I do write very kind of strangely constructed bits uh -huh. that I, I was very happy with. If a joke would work at a mic, I would just make it my identity. So it wasn't even like a real shred of integrity thing. It was just like, oh, okay, yeah, that worked. Uh -huh. I don't care if it's weird. I will continue doing it and hopefully fine tuning it until it gets the most juice out of it. It can. So I wasn't really, unfortunately, developing a true voice. It was just like, oh, this hits. 
it's now mine and yeah. I have to exploit it to its fullest potential, which was probably to my detriment because I'm sure I keep saying, I'm sure or you're sure, but I definitely feel as if the most important thing I should have been doing. And a friend of mine told me this, my very first mic sort of prophetic, like you should need to develop a character on stage. And I never truly did. And I think that was definitely something that held me back because I just fell in the sea of the many people doing absurdist, observational, name droppy type material. But I don't think you could really pick me out of a crowd other than sometimes doing ultra gimmicky stuff, like having an audience member come up and roast me with jokes, roast jokes that I wrote for them. Uh Uh-huh. Or things where I would basically just riff the whole set. That was basically what I did in the last year. But there was nothing that was like, oh, yeah, that's the guy that does impression. The impression guy. Like that, even if that's not really like a personality, it's at least a thing. Uh I I never really had the thing. Yeah. Which I always was desperate to have, which means you're never going to get it because it's not natural. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that... I guess that being uncomfortable and unnatural actually is a persona. Sure. But I don't think anyone wants to hang out with the unnatural (laughs) or there, there is something to that. Yeah. Yeah. Like the guy that's obsessed with gimmicks Uh was, was definitely my thing for a bit, but after a while it becomes a bit much because people have seen your gimmicks at mics and it's just, we, want to see someone do something at least somewhat real because we're not going to put up with your <laughs> fit bullshit mister i've seen it <laughs> this has an expiration date on it that's yeah. very soon and you was, were also you were involved in the one of the oddest roast battles i've ever seen in my life with the korean dude oh brian kim yeah that was <laughs> it looked, oh my god that you did your homework. I bombed that one so hard. Yeah, so that's and it looked like neither one of you wanted to be there. And it was just, I loved watching it because the cringe was just great. I And I love cringe. I love uncomfortable silence. I love what, the, that the two guys on stage are just totally uncomfortable. It, it was great. So that one was really bad. Maybe one of the lowest moments of my entire <laughs> Comedy and I period, love it. Not the lowest. There's another lowest moment, which is an early gimmick that I did that I just remembered was when I was 16, I did strip comedy. Where if a joke <laughs> wouldn't work, I would take off a piece of clothing because uh-huh. otherwise all these people would be watching a minor strip. Yeah. And I did this when I was 25 and a woman said she'd get her gun and shoot me <laughs> <laughs> in Arizona. So that was my first lowest moment in comedy. And my second lowest moment was that roast. And I'll give you a little bit of backstory on it. So in New York, there's a sort of Mikey showy roast called Comedy Fight Club with a lot of in-jokes that's a lot of fun. And I did it probably 30 times. I batted around 500, had some great ones, had some ones, had some bombs, just like everyone. I wasn't super consistent. But the first time I roasted my friend Brian Kim, I destroyed him with those very jokes, the inside jokes. <laughs> uh-huh. And my God, I was on fire. So when they asked us to reprise this roast at the stand, which is a much bigger deal with these now revealed to be alt-right horrible people. Rich Voss was there. No comment. I don't know anything about his politics, but I'm sure it's not good. It's like Rich Voss and Big J and Louis J. Gomez and Lisa Ann. Like, it's, it's just very strange. Yeah. Anyway, Brian, Kim, and I practiced the roast at Mike's again together. Uh-huh. Like we went to Mike's together because we both didn't want to bomb. And it did. It continued to do. We'd ask the audience, who do you think won? And I didn't care if I lost. I just didn't want to humiliate myself. Yeah. So I go in. Brian and I had just eaten pizza together before this roast. And I'm feeling good. Like, I go up and I'm very excited. And then I pretty sure the first joke tanks like gets an absolute zero yeah and for both of you yeah but then brian crushes yeah if i recall yeah brian is very funny he's hysterical i once watched him 
destroy with an executive from CISO at a bar show that I produced. <laughs> and it was just one person in the crowd. Uh-huh. And Brian was like blowing straws at them. It was so <laughs> funny. It was like a tour de force. Yeah. Like I love that guy. Anyhow, I digress. That joke bombed so bad. And Scott, have you done roast yourself? I did one that was a, it was like a Zoom comedy roast, but that's the only one I've done. And I, it was awful. Do you, well, you probably put, I'm assuming your second or maybe best joke first, right? Yeah. Like you want to front load. So at least you get the audience in your favor. Yeah. And you might have a poor joke. You probably did. I think I did five that day. You probably jokes number three and four are kind of iffy. One is pretty good. Two's good. Three and four, mediocre. Five, supposedly your best. Yeah. And leave them with a strong impression because you can always redeem yourself with these final jokes. Anyway, when number one didn't hit, everything deflated out of me. It was. <laughs> yeah, you can it see was, it. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was. It was so embarrassing. If that didn't hit, I was just like, oh two, three, and four aren't going to hit, maybe five hits. And it was just an instantaneous moment where I didn't want to be there anymore. Yeah. Because <laughs> that joke, I don't remember what it was, but I remember it working five or six times. And when a joke bats a thousand, I always say, if a joke's batting a thousand, you're happy. If a joke's batting 980, it's batting zero in your mind. Because yeah. It bombed once. So once it had that one miss... I was done. I couldn't do it anymore. And I went back to roasting and I never did well at these like bigger roast shows with Uh the real judges. They always found something to pick on me for, but I continued to do fine at the smaller ones. But wow, that, that shook me to my core. Uh It was one of those moments. What am I doing? I've been at it for (laughs) years. I do remember I did get a good comeback on Rich Voss about how he lost to that fan, which I was proud of. (laughs) I don't know if you got that far. But yes, yes. I, I like, love. <laughs> you did the exact same thing as me, Rich, about six years ago. Yeah. <laughs> so please, a little respect. <laughs> Which uh, I had not planned because I was planning on winning. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so when you have moments like that, so you talk about a couple of them. Are you at the point, how do you process it and then go back the next day and do comedy? I wasn't doing any high profile shows. Uh-huh. Uh, I was looking at your list of guests that you've had on the show. I would say I'm probably the least high profile guest you've ever had, but I, <laughs> I'm in the lower 10%. So I, w- I went back and just grinded harder uh-huh. mics and sat at Sweet Green by myself writing lots of jokes. And I'm sure, as you do, tried them out on my wife constantly, Mm -hmm. made sure I said them out loud before I got to the mic a few times, just so they felt fresh. And then when I got there, I ended up just riffing my entire set, which was 98% of comedy. Like you go, and then you're like, I just want to talk about the room. Yeah, It's no fun to talk about the time I went to eat ice cream with my grandma. No one cares. That was a, another big stumbling block for me where I would bail on material all the time just to have fun in the room, which I think was better, but made my material suffer because I was like, I would much rather be present rather than like dead behind the eyes and you doing the thing where you spend just a minute doing kind of spontaneous, original, crowd worky, making fun of what's going on, and then jumping into material and then sucking every ounce of fun out of everything. Yeah. <laughs> it's the hardest transition. I feel Been like they're done that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like you're having so much, you're bouncing off the walls. Everyone's like, this guy is the best comic at this mic. And then you instantly become the worst. Yeah. <laughs> it's. I think you can't do that. You have to either jump into material or just maintain that level of energy, which is hard to do Uh because you don't feel the same about something that's literally just happening. You're trying to remember the jumble that you wrote on the way over. Yeah. Yeah. And it's nerve wracking and not even close to as fun. Yeah. We used to have, when I was in South Bend, 
there was an open mic at the drop comedy club and it would either be all comedians or a whole bunch of Notre Dame folks would stop in and it would be like standing room only. And every single time I just chickened out on my new material and working on it. And I would just bring out greatest hits every time the Notre Dame crowd was there. And that's not good for anybody. It's it, for that. Yeah. For the audience. Yeah. And some of them like, like you mentioned, some of them heard the jokes too many times and they were like, yeah, we know that one. And at the time I was working completely clean and they were always just uh, edging me into saying bad words and just yelling them at me. And instead of saying, golly, say fuck and stuff like that, it became a game like that. But yeah, it's, it's a, it, when you only have one or two open mics in a city, you really need to use them to get better instead of bringing out the greatest hits. That's for sure. Yeah. I love the greatest hits, but it always felt like a cheat. Yeah. Every time they came out, I was like, ah, oh, I can't believe I'm doing this. <laughs> I'm bringing the Seinfeld bit out again for the billionth time. Yeah. When I wanted to try the basketball joke that I spent a week on, but had no confidence in whatsoever. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, I think what does separate people is those that commit to the new stuff and constantly grow because if you fear you're going to bomb, you're never going to get any further. Yep. And you stay with the same 15 minutes forever. They'll just have 15 minutes yep. forever. Yep. For yeah. sure. Now in the, when you were doing stand up heavy, did any of, how did that give you the material that you've put down in these sketches and these shorts that you've done? How did all that cross over? I I think I just had a better understanding of what audiences actually laughed at because it goes back to around 2011, my thesis film, another excruciating moment in my comedy <laughs> career. I spent a lot of money, a lot of my parents' money. $10,000 if I remember. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was extremely proud of my thesis film. I made not a David Lynchian movie, but a very heavy Wes Anderson ripoff. Uh -huh. And I thought it was the funniest joke, chock full of joke film that the world had ever seen. It was super meta mm -hmm. and had a lot of kind of esoteric references. And I was so pumped that the crowd at this screening would just go gaga for it like it was everything that i loved and it was met with a smattering of chuckles here and there and that was the moment where i was like i don't really know how to do comedic filmmaking i stressed over every single moment of every frame and a lot of it was just like this is amusing and not funny. I think once I started doing stand-up, I was like, oh, I can rework this bit into a sketch. And I ended up actually screening all of my sketches at a Best of Matt Levy, which was my dream forever last year. And the stuff that I thought would work worked. And in front of an audience was essentially a large bringer. It was mostly friends and family. There were a few strangers that showed up. But the later era stuff where I was more heavily involved in stand-up definitely played more to the crowd because there was actual misdirect and it wasn't all just like weird little visual filmmaking gags that were nerdier yeah. and stuff more that I enjoy. But that's a bit more palatable. I guess the real lesson here is I'm just a big sellout and uh, people and I'm a spineless people pleaser is what it really is. The Hey, that's how you make it. The, the theme. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I don't think it is. I think we all love people that stick to their guns. Yeah. I think if you bend over backwards for everyone, there's a little bit of a lack of respect. That's definitely me. This is turning into therapy. But so think I don't want to interrupt you, but the short with the 
two guys that couldn't get around each other. The It was a tall Indian guy and a shorter African-American dude. I just thought that was, it, it was like jazz. And re- I really enjoyed that. Now, was that earlier or later? That's later. Okay. So the comedian who is the taller comic, Usama Siddiqui, is a famous touring comic now. Oh, okay. And you should definitely get Usama on the show. He's the funniest person as is Mark King, the other guy in the short. But that was, I think, done in 2017 or 2018. Okay. And it was another one where I actually learned a lesson on set, which was you really have to, it's called bridging the gap, is what my film school teacher said. And as soon as we were on set, the bit where they were dribbling at the beginning was not working at all. Like, it wasn't funny. And... The guy wasn't a great dribbler. So like the bit where they're going back and forth Uh with each other, trying to get past one another with the ball, it was like, oh, it's less funny once we bring out the gag. So it took a few different ideas to actually make that connect and quote unquote bridge the gap. Uh We had to film it in extreme close up and film their feet instead of wide, which I did not have in my storyboards ahead of time, which Mm. was set us back big time. And then it took forever in the edit. But then I was like, obviously we need the nba music to make it feel like we're in an nba game so i definitely just ripped that from youtube (laughs) and (laughs) and after i did that i was like okay this feels like how it did in my head but my film school teacher who made a movie that was a lot like my thesis film and that it was very filmy but actually did get some industry recognition and was a big deal. It's called Mad Boy, I'll Blow Your Blues Away. And I think it's online. My teacher's name was Adam Collis. He made this proclamation in our class, which was, you have to bridge the gap, which is you have to see the movie in your head and then make that movie. Because if it's just on the page, you're not really seeing them. You have to see the whole thing, every frame. And once you do that, you can actually go ahead and make the movie. Don't wash the scene down, as he says, and get mm-hmm. like the standard coverage of the wide and the close-ups. You got to actually figure out the angles and how every line is delivered. And you, if an actor needs help with a line, you don't give them a line reading. You give them a verb to get them to emote properly. So it was a lot of trying to figure that out. And honestly, we filmed that one in like three hours. Once that basketball thing was done, They were both so funny. Like I have found making sketches and I don't know if you've had this experience as well, making videos or shorts or anything like that, but you spend the first hour on whatever the first angle is and it's excruciating trying to get everything right. The actors aren't properly rehearsed. The lighting isn't quite right. And then you scramble for the rest of it, which is not a great way to make movies (laughs) or sketches, but it's it happens almost every time. So at that time, I wasn't super active in making stuff. I was rusty, so I had that experience. But after that, I was like, all right, no matter what, I got to rehearse with the actors ahead of time so they are on the same page as me. And after that, everyone was. But that one was so much fun, and I love it. One of my friends, the guy who told me that I should have a comic persona, also said that I ripped it off. So there is that, too. He's a very critical friend. Yeah. Yeah. Every, <laughs> everything's been ripped off. And, and there's the one where you're running and you see the guy on the stoop and you go, yeah, you're doing the yeah stuff. And then he says, I got to go make pancakes. And th- the most interesting and funny part of him making the pancakes is he pours the entire pitcher of pancake batter i i I just i watched that a couple times because that i i thought that was filmatic genius (laughs) (laughs) just happened on the spot man (laughs) there was no vision for that moment i loved it yeah when it happened i was like one take wonder we're done we're out (laughs) Yeah, it was so weird. And he actually improvised the line about pancakes as well. Oh, okay, cool. cool. Yeah, that was all my friend Fluke. Very fun. Another guy you should have on this podcast. Uh-huh. Super funny dude. And raps as well. Oh, but, cool. Yeah, that was just a fluke. Yeah. I can't. It was literally a fluke. That was all him. <laughs> a and fluke I love that fluke. moment too. Yeah, I like that. 
He's the greatest. I wanted to get into a little bit about the email digester. What do you call an email list now? Self-aggrandizing, self-indulgent. It's a newsletter, I would yeah, say. Yeah, news. There you go. And you're uh, from reading that you're definitely a student of the arts, and you really look at stuff to understand the whole process better and the long form like the long form of the breakdown of the last snl episode and things like that you're definitely watching it with a critical eye what have you learned by doing that and what was the reason to start the newsletter in the first place i think i've learned that by doing the newsletter I hold myself accountable to never be a passive viewer. Okay. And I make sure that if I'm watching something, I don't, if that I'm doing it to actually get something out of it rather than just let it just exist as a screensaver that talks. Like I'm trying to see what the intent was because the goal is to make stuff professionally someday myself as well and i've been floundering and tinkering away at it forever and as a byproduct of it i have found that more than anything the most enjoyable part because i dread writing the review stuff it's just for me really i think if readers enjoy it that's fantastic but the thing i enjoy most is when i write about my friend's work or mm. people peers of mine that i haven't really met but have heard about and build them up because I always wanted someone to do something like that and it just didn't exist. Mm. And I started writing this actively in January 2019 and I did it because there was a documentary I had seen about two open mic comedians in New York who had passed away. The documentary is called Hysterical mm. and it was about a guy named Alan Shane okay. who used to go on stage with a front facing phone. So he'd have his phone like this to his face mm -hmm. and he would perform like this. And all of his punchlines were about hot buckets of cum. <laughs> <laughs> and he was fascinating. The documentary is incredible. You should track it down for yeah. sure if you can. And the other comic it was about was this guy named Gary. It's Gary, but. He called himself Gary uh -huh. intentionally. And he was an extra on 30 Rock. He may have had a few lines here and there, but Seth Pompey and another comic who I didn't really know as well produced this doc on a shoestring budget following these two guys around in 2014, 2015 before they both passed. Mm -hmm. It's oddly coincidental. It's a little creepy when they both died and there was a documentary about both of them. Wow. Was it was it Seth Pompey that killed them? I don't know. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> the doc never really went anywhere, but there was a screening and Robert Smigel was there. Uh -huh. and it was like a big deal. It was really cool. And it felt like a reunion of sorts with all the comics I had come up with and were levels above me because we had this shared reverence for both Gary and... Alan Shane. And I was like, I should write about this. I shouldn't just let this moment pass. And I also had a show that week. And I was like, I should probably say something about this show that it, I did done a show with Joe List and Joe List told me nice set. And I was like, okay, I should probably mention that too in a yeah. kind of humble way. And maybe I'd also seen a video or sketch that a friend had put out. So I just called it Comedy Stray Notes essentially ripping off the AV club stray observations that they put at the end of their TV reviews. And then I really didn't miss a week other than I think a week in June, 2020. And then these past few weeks, because I was making a short, which is like a sort of last hurrah before we have the baby. And then I directed a second short starring my wife that she wrote. That's her last hurrah. Just so we have some creative project that we think will bring us success in the future uh -huh. <laughs> rather than just letting our dreams completely flounder. Although I will say last night during dinner with my brother who's in town, I got an email from JFL saying, sorry, 
your pilot was not accepted for oh. our pitch program. So it's like, I still have this one thing that's not edited that I can hold all my hopes on to. <laughs> There's one thing left. I love having one last thing. One of the things I like about your newsletter, and I subscribe to a bunch of them, and a lot of the newsletters are really just cut and paste type st stuff. It's just, here's something I read, or here's a video that's cool and stuff like that. I like that you actually put your own take on things, and it's more of a, it, it's more of a personal type thing than just putting content out there just for the sake of putting it out there. All I can say to that is thank you. Yeah. That's, very nice to hear. I really do it in this somewhat slapdash manner, but I do feel that it has some value. If anything, I think it's nice to highlight other people's work, even if it's for me too. I always wanted like a New Yorker profile that I didn't ask for, just existed. Like someone went out of their way to review my stuff. And I try to do that every week. So after this podcast, I'm probably going to listen to a few more episodes of this. And I'll say <laughs> something like, Scott really does his homework, whereas a lot of podcasts is just a sort of basic conversation. He watched Cotton Candy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Finish, okay. Which, understandably. Okay. So, and like, by the way, Cotton Candy, what the fuck? I don't expect anyone who's <laughs> actually listening to this podcast to go back on it, but <laughs> I, I'm putting it in the show notes. <laughs> I wrote that one in 20 minutes. It's like a 20 minute short. It's maybe 13 minutes after the cut. Uh -huh. Yeah, I, I wrote it like on a whim. Like I had been in an airport late at night and I talked to a stranger and we had a kind of bizarre 4 a.m. conversation. Uh -huh. It didn't really resemble the movie in any way, but I was just like, what if all of these weird little things happened? And I turned it into a movie and uh -huh. I didn't get permission from Sky Harbor Airport to film there. And I just <laughs> did it with my friend filming with this weird kaleidoscopic tilt shift lens that <laughs> I stole. I completely stole that from the, the social network, by the way. And <laughs> after that, I learned a lot. Like that was the first sex scene I'd ever filmed. And I learned pretty early on that it, you got to film it in a way that doesn't look graphic and I learned that from my director of photography. He was filming. He was like, this is horrifying to watch. We have to just film faces and fingers and feet <laughs> rather than body because otherwise it's, who is this for? Yeah. So it, it was a big learning experience. But yeah, that was one of those things that I just wrote in 15 minutes. And I was like, it must exist in some capacity because I don't think <laughs> I've ever seen anything like it. I loved it. And it definitely, it, it went places I was not expecting. And oh, thank you. Uh, yeah, it's blue. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh my God. I love the actors, Patricia and Ross. Yeah. So fun. Yeah. They did a great job. Yeah. They were really good. And I'm so bummed that I never, I obviously never got any copyrights, but I had all these cool songs. I had a montage that I filmed for the middle of it. Uh -huh. And just without the music, it didn't make any sense. So there is like a better cut that exists with copyrighted music, but yeah. just will never be seen because. Otherwise, it just gets stricken from the internet. Yeah. But on TikTok, you can put it, whatever copyrighted content you want on. Yeah. Any yeah. Problem, That's weird. Nice. It's weird. It. And it's stupid. I, I've always wanted to do like a music review type podcast because I'm just. You can on TikTok. I'm, I'm a. Yeah. But TikTok, how, how long can you go? Like a minute or something like that? I think it's up to two or three minutes. Now. Yeah. Yeah. So honestly, a two minute mu music review show, I would love that. Oh, okay. Okay, what's next on my list then? Yeah. Yeah. To close this out, if you run if you were to run into somebody that's like you, it's like a mirror image of you and you see him at an open mic in New York, what advice would you give them to make their comedy life better quicker? <sighs> Find a persona. That really works for stand up for sure. Because then you can write to that rather than pulling from the ether every time. Like if you're Roseanne, it's a lot easier to write for Roseanne than even Seinfeld. I feel like Seinfeld's always pulling his hair out 
yeah. trying to be like, what's funny about grass? Yeah. Grass is funny, but why? Yeah. Whereas Roseanne can just be angry at grass. Another canceled comic, of course. <laughs> but just her point of view is what's funny, not uh-huh. grass. So the real shortcut, and if I was to write for a comic, I'd be like, let's focus less on the material and more on what makes you funny versus the jokes. And I'll be honest, over the pandemic, I did do quote unquote comedy therapy where I acted as people's managers for an hour. And it was some of the most rewarding comedy related activity activities. I don't think that sentence works in any capacity (laughs) that I've ever done because I was listening to people's material and we were talking about it in a way that was like, all right, this isn't playing to the height of your intelligence. Or if you really want to tour, let's find venues that make sense for you. And Uh it was stuff that was like, oh, I should have done all of this for myself. But when you're looking on the outside versus inside, it's so much easier to be an armchair critic yeah, and or cheerleader even rather than introspective about yourself. And while I was doing it, I was like, how did I never think of any of this stuff for myself? So I would highly recommend rather than trying to find someone else find, seek me out i'd be happy to be your comedy therapist I, I would love to listen to what you have to say even if you've done just one open mic or zero open mic it's rewarding to treat it like it's your real career and not as just like a silly thing because like everyone else does treat it as it's something dumb but in your mind it's like this is what i want to do so when i talk to a friend or someone that i don't really know about what their five-year plan in comedy is. They're like, oh, I guess I want to tour in five years. And that's really vague thought. It's trying to say, all right, you want to tour in five years. Are you in any clubs? No. Do you know any of the club managers? Have you ever sent your avails? Have you ever thought about running a show at the club? Kind of step-by-step process versus just having all these vague goals and no persona and just hoping everything falls in your lap, which... Unfortunately, it never will, as easy as it seems for other people. You have to treat it more like a job than you expect, Yeah, which didn't connect until I was talking to other people about it and being the annoying person that gives you homework that I'm there with you for, but I thought was very valuable. The only problem to these sessions is they peter out after about five sessions because the person's, I think we got it. I know what to do now. So... It's like a good five session thing. Like we get acquainted, then we're like, okay, let's listen to all the material ever and try and give it some shape. Talk about the future. Let's talk about other side projects you want to do. And then one where they break up with me. Uh They're like, (laughs) yeah, I think I get it. It's cool. (laughs) But it was fun. I think I probably did 10 with some people that were great. Uh Uh-huh. There's certainly a tipping point. Some people come back like a year later and they're like, hey, let's figure it out. And they do three. And then they're like, "Ah, unfortunately, I'm low on cash or I just don't have the time to do it anymore. But there is a brief period of time where I feel like I'm the most helpful person in the world to people. Uh And that is a service I'm happy to provide to any listeners or anyone that's interested Great. And you've got, you definitely got a great comedic eye. So I I think that anybody that would enlist your services would get something out of it. And I did tell people if I did not bring them any value, it's on the house. And I think I had out of 50 sessions, two that were clunkers Uh where I felt bad. And I, they still both paid me out of guilt, but I said, please, I don't want your money. But it does happen as any therapy session, you may not connect. Yep. But yep, for sure. I definitely feel like I tapped into something that people didn't know about themselves. And I will I'll name a name because he publicly named it. My friend Ben Miller got the Edinburgh Fringe Fest because of our session. Oh, cool. Yeah. He didn't have a persona, but he was a scientist. And every time I talked to him prior to our session, we'd always he just teach me about science. He'd teach me about how microwaves were different than ovens, which I didn't really retain the knowledge, but I know they're different. Yeah. And he would never really lean into it. His jokes were about like, they were like self-deprecating humor. And I was uh-huh. like, Ben, you're really funny, but 
you've got this science thing that you can turn into an educational one-man show that's sort of a more subversive, edgy Bill Nye kind of thing. Yeah. And after a while, he did. He turned it into a web series that was pretty solid, and he turned it into a one-man show, and now he's going to Edinburgh. Wow, that's great. I know. Yeah. Yeah, it was just that one hour. We only yeah. got once. Yeah, you got to feel good about something like that coming out of it. And he totally deserves it. He is an incredible joke writer. It was just just jokes about whatever. But now he's the science guy. Yeah. You're like, oh, I got to book the science guy because he's not just every other comic. Uh-huh. And then you just kind of skyrocket. Yeah. All of a sudden you're a thing. That's cool. Yeah. I like that. Matt, thank you so much for being on the show. And you are not in the lower 10% of the people I've talked to. And... That's not what the podcast is about. It's a learning. It's a learning podcast. I, I would. Uh, I would ask. I don't know. Lewis Black the same types of questions. So you know, it, it's. And I'd love to have famous people on, but most of them just either ignore me or say no anyway. So it's working. Pe- people who are working and in, in it are really the ones that are experiencing it right now. And most of the famous ones forgot what it took to get them to where they are. <laughs> Fair. Yeah. I will say I did listen to the Neil episode before this because I'm buds with Neil Rubenstein. Oh, and, cool. Yeah. And I thought that was a great interview. And uh-huh. I felt that I had to live up to Neil's prowess. So if he is listening. Great job, Neil. Yeah. And great questions from you again. And once again, you did your homework. Yeah. Yeah. Neil, I really connected well with Neil and we've exchanged a few notes back and forth. And he's on that big Motion City soundtrack tour right now and and just loving it. I just saw a post that he did and he's just absolutely loving life. But I did, I'll have to send you a link, but I did cut up some of his audio to make Instagram reel that uh, I think it's my greatest achievement and it's like one of my least watched reels <laughs> oh i'll watch it right now yeah yeah it's it, it's my favorite but as neil does he, he talks about killing himself so i was able to put that into some uh stuff i overdubbed over it about how'd you like the podcast and stuff like that so it was i i really enjoyed what i did and uh, i sent it to everybody i knew and i got no feedback it was maybe a little too dark <laughs> <laughs> Every time, man. The hard, the stuff you work the hardest on, nothing. Yeah. The stuff you just throw into the ether, that's the stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Every time. That's why. And you know why? Because the stuff you like sweat on and really love, they can feel the stank. Yeah. They feel the desperation. Uh-huh. J- just like with the gimmicky stand up, people are like, you're trying too hard. Yeah. You're not yeah. You're thinking about this at 3 a.m. Yeah. Thanks so much for doing this. Yeah, I'm dude. glad I got to know you better. And congratulations on being a dad coming up. Thank you very much. My wife is way more prepared than I am. Yeah. That's the way it's supposed to be. She's in charge of everything. And I feel bad that I haven't done more. Yeah. Well, yeah. you j- just be a good dad. Yeah. That's, just be there. Yeah. That's all you got to do. And, just know they're always going to love mom more. That's just the way it is. <laughs> yeah. True that. Yeah. And they're always, when they get older, they're always going to call mom 10 times more than they call dad. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> but I'm not bitter. It's okay. Uh, Thanks again. And yeah. if people want to find you, I've got mattlevycomedy.com. That'll be in the show notes. How, how about uh, socials? My Twitter handle is mattlevy 51 and my Instagram and TikTok are the very embarrassing matter day, like Saturday with an M, <laughs> underscore night, underscore Levy. So matter day, underscore night, underscore Levy, matter day, night Levy, okay. as you can probably tell. Very embarrassing. Yeah. I'm obsessed. I love it. Thanks so much, Matt. My pleasure, man. Thank you for having me on. And then you can also follow the, if you want to get the email oh, yeah. just on Substack. Yeah. It's Matt Levy's comedy stray notes.substack.com. They usually come out Sunday or Monday. Yeah, and I'll have a link to that in the show notes too, folks. So just uh, it'll be very easy. All you got to do is click links. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, Matt. Yeah, I appreciate it.